Good evening. It's good to see that all, all that are out with us tonight. It's certainly a pleasure to be able to stand before you and talk about God's Word. We're going to talk about David tonight, King David. What can we learn from King David? A mighty man. If you would open your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. 1 Chronicles chapter 21. And we're going to read that whole chapter. Because throughout that chapter, there are many points that will benefit you and I. And tonight I want you, along with myself, to consider what we can learn from King David. In 1 Chronicles chapter 21, starting in verse 1. Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and to the leaders of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, May the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my Lord, the king, are they not all my Lord's servants. When then, when then does the, my Lord require this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Then Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to David. All Israel had 1,100,000 men who drew the sword, and Judah had 400,000 excuse me, 470,000 men who drew the sword. But he did not count Levi and Benjamin among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. And God was displeased with this thing, for therefore he struck Israel. So David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Then the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Choose for yourself either three years of famine or three months to be defeated by your foes with the sword of your enemies overtaking you, or else... For three days the sword of the Lord, the plague in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now consider what answer I should take back to him who sent me. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man." Verse 14, So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell. And God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord looked and relented of the disaster and said to the angel who was destroying, It is enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Then David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven, having in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. So David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell on their faces. And David said to God, Was it not I who commanded the people to be numbered? I am the one who has sinned and done evil indeed. But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, O Lord my God, be against me and my father's house, but not against your people, that they should be plagued. Therefore the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So David went up at the word of Gad, which he had spoken in the name of the Lord. Now Ornan turned and saw the angel, and his four sons who were with him hid themselves, but Ornan continued threshing wheat. So David came to Ornan, and Ornan looked and saw David, and, and he went out from the threshing floor and bowed before David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar on it to the Lord. You shall grant it to me at the full price, 
that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. But Ornan said to David, Take it to yourself and let my lord the king do what is good in his eyes. Look, I also give you oxen for burnt offerings, the threshing implements for wood and the wheat for the grain offering. I give it all. Then David, excuse me, then King David said to Ornan, No, but I will surely buy it for the full price. I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings which thou with that which cost me nothing. So David gave Ornan six hundred shekels of gold by weight for the place, and David built there an altar to the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and called on the Lord, and he answered him from heaven by fire on the altar of burnt offering. So the Lord commanded the angel, and he returned his sword to its sheath. At that time, when David saw that the Lord had answered him on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, he sacrificed there for the tabernacle of the Lord and the altar of burnt offering, which Moses had made in the wilderness, were at the, at the time on the high place in Gibeon. But David could not go before it to inquire of God, for he was afraid of the sword of the angel of the Lord. A rather long reading, but there are some very important points that we can, that we can gain from King David. As I read this chapter, one thing jumps out to me. And maybe it's perhaps the same thing that jumps out to you. That Satan is always there to tempt us. If King David, the mighty man, King David, the king over all of Israel, can be tempted by Satan and be persuaded by Satan, we can too. But remember that Satan is always there to tempt us. In 1 Peter chapter 5, First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, it describes what Satan is, what the devil is. But before we do that, let's consider that verse in chapter 21 once again. Now state, Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. The Bible says, Be sober. That means of sound mind. It also tells us to be vigilant. It encourages us to be watchful. Be of sound mind and be watchful. Because your adversary... What is this word adversary? Does everybody know what adversary means? It's an enemy. Our enemy. The devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Satan is always there to devour us. Satan is always there to tempt us. Me, you, and you. It's not an occasional soberness that we must have. It's not an occasional vigilance that we must have. But it's a, it's a constant soberness and vigilance that we must have. How can we be sober and vigilant at all times? How can we not be deceived by the deceitful Satan? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Now... Why was it that David, being tempted, fell into this sin? Well, first of all, he wasn't being sober and he wasn't being vigilant. He wasn't watching out. I don't know what was going in his mind, but maybe he was proud. Maybe he felt that he couldn't be tempted. Does that sound like us sometimes? Do we feel that there is that Satan can't get into our hearts and tempt us and lead us away from God. But in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, it says to us, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And this is how we defend ourselves against the devil. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of 
of the devil. The wiles of the devil. What does this mean? The deceitfulness of the devil. How do we stand against the deceitfulness of the devil? We have to put on the whole armor of God. Not just part of the armor of God, as we will see. We'll go down and we'll see what the armor of God is. Not just one or two, but the entire armor of God we must put on. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with preparation of the gospel of peace, Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to stand, excuse me, be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. We must rely upon the whole body, excuse me, the whole armor of God. Truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. We must have all this. Do you, do I utilize the whole armor of God? And if we don't, how can we expect to not be deceived by Satan. King David was deceived by Satan. Second point I think that we can get from 1 Chronicles chapter 21 is that David didn't trust in God. Now there were many times that he did trust in God, but at this moment he didn't trust in God. Let's go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 21 and let's focus on verses 2 through 4. So David said to Joab and to the leaders of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, May the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my Lord the king, are they not all the Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? Nevertheless... Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. David didn't have confidence in God. He didn't trust God. He didn't have that faith in God. He was, he was concerned about how many men of war that he had. How many men that could draw the sword and defeat the enemy? We can go throughout the Bible and find many occasions where, where just but a few people were necessary. Only a few people were called to defeat an entire army. It didn't matter how great an army David had. And we have seen just the opposite of that. A great army of Israel being defeated by very few. The important thing is that we have to trust in God, that David needed to trust in God. David trusting in God could have defeated any size of army with one soldier. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. In verse 5, again, remember, David did not trust in God. And does that describe us? Do our actions, do our thoughts, do the way that we live our lives show that we trust in the Lord? In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. It will be health... Excuse me. Do not be wise in your own eyes. 
fear the Lord and to depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Trust in the Lord with all our heart. Don't lean onto our own understanding. Do you know what's best for yourself? Or am I too proud to rely upon God? Are you too proud to rely upon God? David was too proud to rely upon God. Also in the same book, in chapter 28, in verse 26, it says, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. If we trust in ourselves, if we don't allow God to direct our path, if we don't have the confidence in God, the faith in God, we are a fool. But whosoever walks wisely will be delivered. Again, these, these characteristics of David, are they in our life? Maybe David was concerned that they would have to face an enormous enemy, a strong enemy. And maybe that's the reason he numbered Israel. What about Matthew chapter 19? This should make us very confident in God. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 26. With men this is impossible. And it's talking about a rich man going to heaven, a camel going through the eye of a needle. And he says in verse 26, And he said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Is there anything that is not possible for our God? I encourage you to think of one. Right now, as you're sitting in your seat, think in your mind, what's impossible for God to do? Can you name one? Can you name anything that's impossible for God to do? Now, I'll put you on the spot. Of course, you're going to say, well, there's nothing that's impossible for God to, to do. But do our actions show that? Does, does our behavior show that? The way we live our lives... Does it show that we feel that that's nothing is impossible with God? I encourage you, if you're not living that way, to start living that way. One other point that I, th I think that we can gain from 1 Chronicles chapter 21 was that King David's sin brought terrible consequences upon others whom he loved. King David sinned. But who was punished? Those whom he loved. Let's go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. And let's look at verse 16 and 17. Then David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven, having in his hand a, a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. So David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell on their faces and David said to God, Was it not I who commanded the people to be numbered? I am the one who has sinned and done evil indeed. But these sheep, what have they done? What have they done? So the point of this is when I sin, sometimes the consequences affect those that I love. Sometimes the consequences of my sin will affect those that I don't even know. Someone robs a convenience store and the clerk is killed. We've seen it in the news, haven't we? That clerk's small children and his wife will continue to go on and suffer the consequences of that sin. They didn't do anything. But still, they, they have to suffer the consequences of that sin. 
Mom and dad are tired of being married. They don't really get along anymore, and they just decide that they're going to get divorced for, for no particular reason. But because of that sin, who suffers? The children suffer the consequences of that sin. So when we think that when we sin, it only affects us, let's not be so ignorant of that. Let's not, let's not fool ourselves into thinking that the things that we do do not, do not affect others, but they certainly do. We can sin just like David and affect others that are innocent. In Numbers chapter 14, Numbers chapter 14, In verse 26, this is a very good illustration of, of a people sinning and others suffering the consequences of that sin. In verse 26, And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so will I do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness, and all of you who were numbered according to your entire number from twenty years old and above, except for Caleb the son of Jephthah and Joshua the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I, may, I would make you dwell in. But your little ones, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in, and they will know the land which you have despised. But as for you, Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. So the children had to suffer the consequences of the parents because of their sin. They wandered in the wilderness for forty years. The point is, when we sin, sometimes the consequence of that sin falls upon the innocent and they have to suffer the consequences. One last point. Could David's actions influence Israel to sin against God in the future? And of course, what application can we make for ourselves? Could our actions, could my actions, cause someone to sin today or in the future? Think about that. King David was a mighty man, a mighty man of God, a very well-respected, a very well-loved king. And when people saw him do evil, could this not influence them to do evil? Look, David, David does it. It, it should be all right. David's a man after God's own heart. He's a man that follows God. If David does it, if dad does it, if mom does it, it it's got to be all right. My best friend does it. My boyfriend does it. My girlfriend does it. My brother, my sister does it. It must be all right. So could David's actions influence? Absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. David's actions could influence those to do wrong. And just like today, you and I can influence those that we love to do what's wrong. So it, it's a word of encouragement that we need to be aware of that. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 11. In 1 Kings chapter 11, let's look at verse 1. Very well-known story of King Solomon. A man known for his wisdom. 
But in this chapter, his heart is turned away from God. The mighty man Saul. 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 1, But King Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said, The children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor with they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their God. Solomon clung to these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned Away his heart. Now, it doesn't take all of these wives and concubines to turn a man's heart away. It just takes the influence of somebody they love. But King Solomon was persuaded away from God by his wives. And I say that to show that most assuredly, King David, by his actions, could persuade people to no longer follow God. As we, as we end the lesson tonight, let's remember that Satan is always ready to tempt us. And with that in mind, we need to, be, we need to take precautions. We need to be someone that always trusts in God. And we need to understand that when we sin, there are consequences of sin that may just not affect us, but may affect those that we love, maybe even more severely than they affect us. Do you understand what I'm saying? We may get off easy, but those that we love may suffer the most terrible of consequences because of our sin. What influence are you having on others? How are you influencing the people that you're sitting next to? The people that you will drive home with tonight. How are you influencing them? If we can help you in any way tonight, we ask you to come forward as we stand and sing.